Well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and hello, Lynx community. Um, Jamie and Peter, um, we're here with, from our student government. Um, we're here today with Jennifer Sorbonne, who is CU Denver's Chief Financial Officer, and Jen St. Peter, um, the Senior Director of Revenue Projections. Um, we've heard questions from you about tuition and fees, and hopefully you've seen the communication that came out earlier this week with more information on this. Um, we'll try to save some questions from you who are directly zooming in. Um, and you can ask those um, via the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Um, I'll let Jennifer and Jen introduce themselves before we begin. Great. Thank, thank you so much, Jamie and Peter. We really appreciate being invited into this SGA Zoom event. Um, we hope you have many more of these going forward so we can talk to you and to our fellow students. I'm Jennifer Sobene. I'm the Chief Financial Officer of CU Denver. And one of the things I wanted to tell you all about myself is I'm a student too here at CU Denver. I'm a grad student in the School of Education and Human Development. And so everything that I do in my role, I see through the lens uh, of a CFO, but also through the lens of a fellow Lynx. And um, I hope that as we go through our conversation today, you can see some of that happening. And before we get started, Jamie and Peter, I just wanna thank you. You have been phenomenal leaders. Um, pre-COVID and now through this time that we're going, this completely uncertain and different, unexpected time that we're going through together. And I appreciate the uh, so much of the time and energy that you put into meeting with us, with the administration, with the faculty assembly, with the staff council, really working to figure our path forward together. So I just want to acknowledge that. Thank you. Hi, I'm Jen St. Peter. Um I work in the budget office as the senior director of revenue projections. It's a mouthful. Um, long and short, I do all of the projections for the campus on the revenue side. And um, I'm also a former Lynx. Um, I actually went to undergrad and grad school at CU Denver. I won't say how long ago, because it was too, I don't want to age myself. Um, but I also um, am an advisor on the student fee review committee, which is a subcommittee of the SGA. And I bet I have some of my uh, committee members out there. Hi, I can't see you guys, but um, so I'm looking forward to answering all of your questions that we can about student fees today. Great, well, thank you so much for introducing. And if you need us to repeat any questions, just let us know. And other than that, we'll hop right in. So the pandemic, of course, was something that caught all of us and the world completely off guard. Can you share some steps that the university took and is taking to respond to the financial challenges that have cropped up as a result of COVID-19. Sure, Jen, I'll take this one and chime in if you have anything else okay. to add, okay? Um, I agree, this pandemic is unprecedented and caught the world off guard. And um, these are difficult times for all of us to get through. And um, I would like to just say before I go into a conversation about the financial challenges that we'll all be facing and I've already started to face is that the lens through which we have tried to make every single decision as we've gone through this together has been the health and safety of our students and faculty and staff. And these have been very difficult times. I'm not gonna um, mince words about that, um, certainly from the beginning when we had to start making decisions about restricting travel. We started with international travel and then domestic travel. I know some of you were caught up in those decisions and that was hard to handle. And then we had to move into making decisions around gatherings of large people, numbers of people. Do you remember that when we started to say large conferences or big meetings can no longer um, take place, even our um, admit day we had to, to cancel because there were so many students coming. And um, then even the smaller groups, we had to wean ourselves off of coming together that way. Um, and then of course, we made the decision that after spring break, we were gonna go remote for remote teaching and learning as well as working. And then we had to speed that up. And I will say that having that guiding light of that very, um, centered goal of the health and safety of our students really helped us make those decisions um, as tough as they were. And um, we, were, we were just so fortunate to be a part of 
the Denver Anschutz University community because we have access, of course, to our colleagues at Anschutz in the School of Public Health. And, and Peter and Jamie, you know, we get updates from them on a regular basis. And it's just, a, just we're so fortunate to have those experts as part of our university. And I, I can't mention Anschutz without mentioning, of course, the healthcare workers that are on the front lines helping all of us across this entire state and express my gratitude to our fellow students who are on the Anschutz campus as well as the faculty and staff who are really helping across the state, um, all of us manage through this, this, um, our, this experience with COVID-19. Um, on the financial side of things, Peter, as you were asking, we will face financial challenges. We are beginning to face those. Um, the first phase of any experience like this is to first try and understand the different scenarios that we might be looking at over the next year, two or three years and look at it from a multi-year budgeting perspective and do scenario planning around those types of, um, uh, of potential outcomes. But really right now we're focusing on how can we mitigate the challenges that we think we're going to be experiencing. And um, a couple of ways that we're working on that is we're working with the CU system office um, we have incredible team members there. Um, our chief financial officer, Todd Solomon, our legislative liaison, Tanya Kelly Bowery, who are working with our federal delegation, um, our, our congressional delegation, as well as our state elected officials. We have President Mark Kennedy, who's a former congressman himself, helping us at the, at the federal level. Our board of regents are reaching out as fellow elected officials. So I, I really feel like we're, um, kind of a full court press on getting our elected leaders educated about what's happening at the CU campuses across the state and helping them understand, again, through scenario planning, what the potential impacts could be, because then they can make better decisions when they're informed with what's going to be affecting us. And they can help us more um, when we inform them. And so we're working really closely, all the CFOs of all the campuses, the CU campuses, we meet uh, multiple times a week and are, are constantly then working back with our teams at the campus as we get information from our, our system partners. Um, and the other group of people that I'm working with a lot are our Auraria campus community. Uh, I spend a lot of time with the CFOs of MSU Denver, of um, Community College of Denver, and AHEC because we share all of our space together and we have to make those decisions together. And it's really been right now about a lot of it has been first around the operational changes that had to happen for all of us to go remote. Um, but then also now we're looking at the different financial challenges. And so this is our the, the beginning of what will be a long process. So I hope you invite me back as these phases continue so we can talk about them as they unfold. Definitely. All right, so we'll jump over to the next one. Um, so one thing that we have appreciated is the de decision CU Denver has made to continue to support student workers during this time. Um, can you tell us more about that decision to pay student employees through the end of the semester? Oh, absolutely. Thank you for asking that. Um, that was definitely a, a, a very important decision that we made. And a big piece of that is so many of our students do work on campus and you're a part of the fabric of this community. You help make this campus run. And um, the loyalty that you all show to us and the um, loyalty we wanted to show back to you. And I'll, I'll invite Jen to also join in in this conversation too. Um, but I, I yeah, just want to- Did you know we have thousands of student workers on this campus? I, I knew it was in the hundreds because I think maybe I've met at yeah. least a hundred of them, but not thousands. That's, that, yeah. that says a lot. It's a big impact on a lot of lives. And um, I really, a, a big piece of this was, if you think back to that time when that uncertainty was just, everything was changing so fast, what we 
didn't want was to create more uncertainty for our student workers. Um, we wanted to create something that, that you could hold on to and know is going to be um, there for you. Uh, and, and another piece of this, and this is as a fellow student um, talking now, is I think also when you can set aside that worry, you can free up more headspace for actually doing your homework and um, doing it well and thinking about your classes and prioritizing those. Because such a big part of this, of getting through something that's as monumental as this, is focusing on the, on the, on the, the vision of your future. And that is completing your education. And so for me too, and I've had to tell myself that a few times when I've been a little cranky and tired trying to get my homework done, um, it, I have to keep remembering I'm doing this for my future. And um, so a big piece of that decision was around creating stability for our students. Jen, thanks for telling me that. I, I didn't know we were in the thousands. That's, that's fabulous. Yeah. All right, well, thanks. I know myself and hundreds of other student workers are very grateful for that decision. So next question, though students are clearly not on campus, the vast majority of the student fees that we paid are still in use. Can you tell us a little bit more about what these fees are going towards right now while we are not on campus? Yeah, I might have to give you a little, I promise it'll be short, um, tutorial on higher ed finance, <laughs> if you'll let me do that. Um, I know probably the business school majors out there will understand this really well, um, but Jamie and Peter jump in if it doesn't make sense what I'm saying, okay? So a little bit about higher ed finance so you can understand the fees, um, how the fees are used on this campus. So we have multiple funds, it's fund accounting for those of you out there in the business school. Um, so uh, we have the unrestricted fund, which is where the tuition and the majority of our fees go, um, as well as the state support that we receive. Um, then we have restricted funds and we have auxiliary funds. I'm gonna talk for a moment primarily about auxiliary funds. And the auxiliary funds, think of that as um, businesses that run on our campus. It's not uh, like the general ed, the, the unrestricted fund, which is where the teaching and learning occurs and how we really pay for our faculty and staff and our buildings. But these are actually businesses that take place on our campus. We're kind of like a small city on our campus. So we have things like housing and dining and parking and the Lola and Rob Salazar Wellness Center. And those businesses have to bring in enough revenue to cover the expenses of that business without having subsidies from elsewhere. And so I'm gonna take the Lola and Rob Salazar Wellness Student Wellness Center as an example, because that's an example that all of you can relate to because you all voted to create that building and create that amazing space for you to have as you Denver students. And you voted to um, charge yourselves a fee, a, a per credit hour fee, and Jen will help me with how much that is, um, but a per credit hour fee to pay for the, the construction of and operations of the wellness center. And those fees cover the debt service on the bonds that we had to issue to be able to have the money to construct the building. And those fees also pay for the ongoing operations of the Lola and Rob Salazar Student Wellness Center. And that includes the employees, including many student employees who work in the wellness center. And so the, um, those fees go towards the expenses of running that wellness center. And obviously the, the, um, the bonds that we took out to be able to um, construct that building go on year after year after year after year. And so those fees will continue to pay those bonds. Yeah, and just to jump in real fast, um, our current debt on the wellness center is $31 million. So that's a lot of money. And every year we spend $2 million on that debt service payment. That's almost 60 cents out of every dollar that student fees come in for. So a lot of it is just paying for you know, the borrowing that we had to do in order to build the building, not necessarily the operations. 
All right, thank you both. Um, we're gonna skip question four because I think you both have already answered that. Um, so moving on, we're gonna ask, um, for those who lived on campus this year um, or purchased a parking pass, um, can you specifically touch on how those were handled? Uh, Jen, do you mind taking that one? Sure. Um, so for many of our students that come to CU Denver and live on campus, Lynx Crossing becomes their home. And primarily, um, you know, our number one concern was making sure that through all of this crisis, and once we realized that we were going to have to start looking at students leaving, was we wanted to ensure that those students that consider Lynx Crossing their home, that they had you know, a welcoming, safe place to continue to be. Um, for the students that did choose to leave and go and shelter in place elsewhere, um, they've all received partial refunds, so it's all prorated back to the day that um, they move out. Um, they've received refunds on their um, housing and dining costs. So we've, you know, we're doing the best that we can to help the students that have left, but make sure that we can keep our operation going for the students that consider our campus their home. Um, on the parking passes, oh, yeah. Can I interject on that? Because I think too, we're, um, we've been doing some, um, we have a, um, a, the Food Bank of the Rockies has been helping us at the crossing and i believe jamie and, and peter you might chime in on this i think it's every two weeks we're doing uh we're, we're bringing to the uh, the parking lot just next door to links crossing um a um a set of i think um over 200 different um sets of uh, um, packages of, of bulk food for for our students who might need them so i think another great thing about Lynx crossing still being a home for many of our students is we also are able to have food delivered there i think it's every two weeks i didn't mean to interrupt though jen That's great no not at all please um I think the other thing that you had asked about was parking passes. Um, so the parking passes that are operated through AHEC, um, they have been providing refunds for the unused portion of your parking pass for the spring term. I do want to say that today is the deadline. So if you had a parking pass and you haven't requested a refund, please go to um, the AHEC website, ahec.edu, and go and find the um, parking and transportation page and make sure to request your refund by today so that you guys can get that money back for your unused portion. So very, very timely question. Very timely. <laughs> All right, thank you. So as we've heard, the summer 2020 term is moved online. So what can students expect their summer 2020 fee structure to look like? What fees may be covered, et cetera? Hey, Jen, will you take that one, too? And I'm just going to remind everybody about that little primer I gave on higher ed finance. So um, think about that as, as Jen is talking through those fees. And, and we can dig in more as you want to, Jamie and Peter. Yeah, the decision to go um, on campus remote, I think, was really hard for all of us. You know, we really looked forward to seeing everybody on campus and kind of the, the life that, bring, that comes back to campus when the students are around and in the classrooms and walking around. Um, so I think it's been really hard for everybody. Um, part of the thing that we've done um, over the last couple of weeks is really look in between the couch, you know, under the couch cushions to see what we could do, recognizing that if students aren't on campus, they don't have access to certain activities and certain spaces. And kind of getting to what Jennifer said about you know, financing and um, our auxiliaries, a lot of the, you know, Auraria space, it's, it's space, we're paying for debt service and that's what the fees go towards. Um, we have set aside funding to cover the costs for fees that are largely related to activities and services and spaces that students are not gonna be able to access in the summer. And these were all outlined in the communication that went out, but these are gonna be all of your Auraria fees. Um, we're gonna cover the, um, there's not gonna be a fee for the RTD pass over the summer. Um, we're not gonna be charging the wellness center fee. Now keep in mind that those services are still gonna be available to you where they can be. So 
The Wellness Center is going to continue offering remote classes that I hope you guys are all taking advantage of because it's a great way to help keep you sane when you're locked in your house. Um, RTD is still providing services as well. Um, hopefully you're not going in um, outside of safety, but, and then the health center is also still open. We're gonna be covering that cost, that fee, but the health center is still open. So if you do need some sort of service from the health center, please just give them a call. Make sure that they um, can help you hopefully over telemedicine. Um, and if not, they, they'll ask you to come in, but just give them a call first. Um, this is gonna be a really like, a really big discount to your student fees in the summer. Um, we are going to continue um, charging for student services. So all of your student life, um, your career center, your writing center, all that stuff that we've worked so hard to bring remotely very quickly, we're gonna still be charging for those. And I'm hoping that you guys are all using those services. And I'll just, um, oh, sorry, Jeff, yeah. can I chime in? I think that it's a really good point that you're making is that a lot of the, the there is a group of fees that we will continue well, we'll continue to charge all of the fees so what we're going to do is cover through university funds the cost of the sum of those fees but some of those fees that you're going to continue to pay in the summertime are really important ones that you all should be accessing those services it's like the counseling center it's like the writing lab and the tutoring lab and the learning resource center like those are those are things that please continue to access those they've all moved to remote capabilities and are there and waiting to serve you it's the same reason that i know um that um that we made the decision that in the springtime that we need to not be refunding um, tuition and fees for the spring because we've continued all of those activities the teaching the learning the counseling center the phoenix center the um, writing lab and tutoring labs like things that we all rely on all of those services are simply remote right now so access those services they are there to help you be successful in these uncertain times as well as specifically in your academic areas so they are there waiting to hear from you and to help you sorry jen keep going no not at all um i think that was pretty much all i was going to cover on um summer fees oh we're going to cover the online fee as well so whether your instructors are choosing to provide um your your coursework through a remote environment or they're going to move that course to online there's not going to be any cost difference to students because of that decision that the that our, our faculty and staff are making um great news thank you both all right so um can you both tell us a little bit about what financial resources are available to students um, or who they should talk to if they're interested in receiving additional support Sure, I think Jen and I will to tag team this one too. Um, yeah. So financial resources, I think first of all, let's talk a little bit about the CARES Act. Um, we're beginning to get some information uh, about the CARES Act. Right before this meeting, I was on the phone with the CFO um, at the system office and he's getting more information for us about ways in which the money can flow. Um, for the, the um, student aid, as well as what will happen with institutional support from the CARES Act. So please um, just keep your eye out on the communications that we're sending out. Those, I know they come, you get a, a lot of email, but please keep your eyes on those. As soon as we have information on that, we're gonna be able to push that out quickly. Um, another area is part of the CARES Act, if indeed you are unemployed, there is um, a, a lot more money that's going through the unemployment insurance uh, work at the uh, Department of Labor and Employment. So if you haven't been on their website and you have become unemployed, please make sure that you reach out and get, um, um, get those benefits for yourself too. Um, for those of you too who might need a little extra help going through this emergency financially, um, reach out to our Loving Links team on our website um, and, and Jamie, maybe there's a way that you can get that website to your fellow students. But um, the Loving Links Fund is a, it's a fund of, of it's um, philanthropy. Phil um, we have fundraised um, for money to go into the Loving Links Fund. 
Uh, there are many people, faculty, um, staff, even students have uh, donated to the Loving Links Fund and um, corporations have, other foundations have, and that money is there for students who are in an emergency and need a little bit of extra help. And there's an entire process that you can go through to be able to get that help. And um, that's definitely worth um, going on to the website to um, fill out the application to receive emergency resources. Also for anybody who goes onto that website, um, you will also be referred out to community resources that can help you. So it's not just what the Loving Links Fund can do for you. The staff that are behind the scenes doing all the work are going to make sure that you get connected to community resources that can also support you. Um, Jenna, there's some others that you wanted to add in. Yeah, I mean, I think um, if you're concerned around um, making your tuition and fee payments, please contact the bursar's office. And we have lots of options around payment plans and figuring out financial plans for moving forward so that we can keep you on track to, to finishing your degree with us. All right, thank you. The Loving Links Fund is definitely very important right now. We'll make sure to get that link out after this. Thanks. So I know we're almost at three, but I think we wanna continue on with some questions that were asked from the participants who are watching. So if it's okay with everybody to go till 3.15, I think we can extend a little bit. Yeah. So, what discussions are underway about potentially funding student workers through the summer term? You know, um, those discussions are, have just begun as we're making our way from spring thinking into summer. As you know, we've just made these decisions about the fees. I think the biggest thing, because we wanted to impact everybody, is the decision about the fees. All right, thank you. So we'll move on to the next one. Um, will we receive partial funds partial refunds uh, for fees we paid for spring 2020, for example, the rec center, which we didn't get to use the whole semester. But I think you all have already addressed yep, that. Yeah, I think I addressed that. All right, so let's go on to the next one. Um, well, what are we thinking about going online for fall? Oh, wow. Um, so that decision has not been made yet. And this is one of those enormous decisions, similar to the one that we had to make to even um, move remote for the spring semester. And that's something that we um, will not be making immediately because what we want is to be able to have as much information as possible that allows for um, us to make the right decision for all of our students and faculty and staff. I will tell you, I know that everybody wants to come back onto campus. I, I do too, so, so, so much. And this will depend on the advice that we get from um, our public health experts. This will depend on the decisions that are made at the national level and at a state level and at a city level. And obviously it will depend on what we determine is most, uh, um, that the best way to be able to protect the health and safety of our students and our faculty and our staff. And so I, I, I hate that I don't have an answer for you. Um, I wish I had answers for all of these questions because they're taxing for all of us to have this uncertainty in front of us. But what I would say to you is, as, as students who are working towards the goal of finishing their degree, Whatever that decision ends up being, if it's on campus, if it's um, remote or online, or it's um, a mixture of different things. Thank you. So you referenced the CARES Act a little bit earlier, and we know that a lot of those details are still being worked out by lawmakers themselves, but we're starting to get a little bit more information. And so one of the most interesting pieces is that half of the stimulus money that is going to higher education is supposed to be allocated to students. So do you have any idea right now about how students might begin to start receiving some of these funds? Well, we are literally figuring that out as this, uh, as this Zoom interview is happening. Um, we, are, we are working on um, what the allocations, I heard your kitty cat, Jen. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> The joys of all of us being at home. Um, 
but um, we're working on those details of um, how how that money will be distributed, and um, we're ha we're actually waiting on some more information. We've heard that the um, Depart U.S. Department of Ed is still working on some rulemaking, and so that will obviously um, help us better understand what we can do. And so we're just we're just in the throes of figuring this out. So I'm sorry that I don't have more details. Jen, do you have any specific details that um, that you might know more than me just have happened over the past couple of hours? I don't at this time. It's you know, federal lawmaking is is amazing and <laughs> how slow it can go sometimes. I'm sure we're, we're figuring out as, as we fly the plane, right? That's right. I'm sure this is information that we'll be able to get out really quick once we find out, though. Oh, yeah. Peter, you're so great. Thank you for saying that, because that's exactly what we would do, is as soon as we get this figured out, I know everybody is waiting for that information. And as soon as we get it out, that's why I mean, keep keep watching your email for those communiques that are going out um, so that we, so that you have that information as, as, as soon as we do, we're gonna be getting that out to you. And I think, you know, Peter and Jamie, it's a good reason why we need to continue to do these because as we get more information and as the um, events unfold, we can talk about them as we know them. So I'm just sorry that I don't have more information right now. That's okay, thank you, Jennifer. All right, here's another one. Um, so what if a student um, that's in a specific school or college, um, let's say College of Arts and Media, um, can't do on-site learning? Um, I know the student would still get credit, but he or she is not getting the experience. Are any adjustments being made? Um, um, are any adjustments being considered in a case like this? Um, I'm not sure I fully understand the question, but if there's uncertainty that any student is having with a particular class, please reach out to your to your teacher, to your faculty, to your professor. Um, reach out and talk to them if there are accommodations that need to be made, if they're um, if you're having a hard time keeping up with the assignments. Definitely work with your teacher on that. Um, and they, they have access to resources. If you need additional tutoring or additional help, don't, don't, don't be quiet. Go and reach out to them and get help so that you can get through your coursework. I know that, um, and Jamie and Peter, you were a part of, of this, that we have moved the P plus P um, and P um, grading system. Um, you, many of you will still want to get your grades and should because you're going to do a great job this semester. But I think those are ways in which we're trying to um, acknowledge that, that it's a little different for each of us as we move in, myself included, move into this new way of, of learning. And I think and Jennifer, the question might have been Go ahead, Peter. I think you're going to say what I'm going to What, Jamie? I said, go ahead. I think you're going to say what I'm going to say. Okay. I think it's talking about um, specific classes such as film where those students are heavily reliant on equipment that's at the university. And so those students aren't necessarily getting the same experience. Okay. And so some of those students are wondering if tuition adjustments are being considered in those cases. You know, we're not considering tuition adjustments specifically. I know there are specific programs who have specific fees that go to um, specific materials that might be used that are no longer being used. So, so that work with your, your um, school or college on, on that, but um, what the tuition is not just because what our faculty are doing is finding new ways to provide that instruction to our students. Jennifer, the question might have been- Go ahead, Peter, I think trying you're gonna to say get what at, I'm gonna say. Um, what, Jamie? I said, go ahead, I think you're gonna say what I'm gonna say. Okay, I think it's talking about um, specific classes such as film where those students are heavily reliant on equipment that's at the university. And so those students aren't necessarily getting the same experience. Okay. And so some of those students are wondering if tuition adjustments are being considered in those cases. You know, we're not considering tuition adjustments specifically. I know there are specific programs who have specific fees that go to um, specific materials that might be used that are no longer being used. So, so that work with your, your um, school or college on, on that, but um, what the tuition is not just because what our faculty are doing is finding new ways to provide that instruction to our students. All right, great, thank you. So Jamie, I think that's all the questions we have from the audience right now. 
Um, and I know we're over time, so we'll begin to wrap things up. So thanks, Jennifer and Jen, for joining us. And for all of you students who also joined and were able to get your questions answered today. So as we have said a couple times, this is part of a regular series of conversations that we're having with CU Denver leadership to ensure that your questions are being answered during these times. So please continue to keep an eye out on your email and also on social media for more conversations to come. So thanks, Jennifer and Jen. It's Thank you. Thank you. Really appreciate we'll chat it. chat soon. Mm -hmm.